Potable water tanks and towers are an important part of our infrastructure. However, many of us don't realize they're the last stop before that water makes its way to your faucet. Welcome to Tap Talk, where we discuss what's really going on in your water system. We safely put a diver into a water storage tank. We suck all the sediment out of the bottom of it. We get them nice and clean and we pull the diver out. That way the tank gets cleaned, but they never had to take it out of service. When you have a contaminant that can nestle down in something, use it for a habitat and grow. You're gonna start having a war the, like I say, the knee-jerk reaction is just use more disinfectant and that has a chain reaction. Nobody ever thinks, well, let's go ahead and just clean the tank. A lot of times this comes in one little particle at a time. It can't even be seen, but over years it builds up. I'm Ron Perrin with Ron Perrin Water Technologies. Uh, my company inspects and cleans water storage tanks and towers. We've inspected probably close to 6,000 water storage tanks and towers since 1997. We use an underwater camera and we look at the interior roof and also the underwater conditions. We're looking at the conditions of the paint, to looking for structural soundness, make sure the paint's still doing its job, but also we're looking at what's on the floor of the tank. And what we find is that over time, sediment builds up in the floor of the tank one little particle at a time. A lot of these tanks go 20, 30 years without being cleaned. And when we find that, we find an average is up to three inches of sediment. And that, that can look like this. That's less than, you know, it's about a quarter inch of sediment there. I was really surprised how much sediment there was in the bottom of, of tanks. I'm Len Pardee. I'm currently employed by Ron Perrin Water Technologies. I'm uh, the environmental compliance officer and the primary inspector of water tanks. My background is I have a degree in environmental engineering from Syracuse University and um, I'm retired from the Environmental Protection Agency. I worked there from April of 1979 until September of 2008 and from 1979 until um, June of 1995 I was employed in the drinking water section of uh, the water supply branch. I fully expected when we opened the hatch of a tank and looked down in there that it was just going to be bright clean, you know, almost looked like the inside of what you would expect like a milk truck, you know, like a stainless steel milk truck was going to look like on the inside and was, you know, disappointed in most of the tanks and that you look in there and they're not only corroded and sometimes leaking, but uh, that there's quite a bit of sediment on the bottom. It, it has a variety of, of shapes and forms. It has a variety of colors. Two never look the same. But, but even in an eighth inch of sediment, there can be billions of bacteria. Usually whenever someone says microbe, they really mean something you can't see with the naked eye. So uh, it can be everything from viruses, uh, which are probably the smallest living particle, uh, up to protozoa, which are bigger. Uh, but they're still hard to see from the, with the naked eye, things like amoeba and paramecium. Um, in between there, you can have uh, bacteria. My name is Christopher Parker. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Texas Wesleyan University, and I teach microbiology and immunology. Pathogens have several different ways in which they can uh, survive their environment. One way uh, that they can survive is, uh, for example, the bacteria Legionella. Um, it is a water bacteria, but it also lives with inside of amoeba, right? So if you have a water sample that has amoeba, and inside that amoeba you have a Legionella, then that Legionella is not being attacked by the chlorine or whatever you're treating the water with whatsoever. Another possibility is that pathogens also have a way of uh, becoming what's called spores, all right? And so if a bacteria has the ability to form spores, like if they're in the soil, and most soil bacteria can, if they form a spore and those spores end up in the sediment within the tank, then it's, it's, it's conceivable that those spores would not be affected by the chlorine because they are, spores are specifically designed to be resistant to environmental conditions, whether it's chlorine, heat, acid, harsh conditions, no water, more water, whatever. So it's possible that, they, that the pathogens can find a way around. 
1991 to 2000, we had a lot of cases of uh, waterborne disease outbreaks. 21% was caused by the parasites uh, like Giardia, Cryptosporidium, and Aguilaria, they call that brain-eating uh, parasites. I'm Said Samawat, and uh, I've been working in a city municipality for 17 years as a microbiologist, a water quality specialist, and a sampling supervisor. And potable water really is just, is just another term for drinking water. Um, it's just water that's been treated to uh, the quality requirements specified in the Safe Drinking Water Act and the primary drinking water regulations. The way the water distribution works is that the raw water from the lakes, different lakes and reservoirs we have, they are kind of piped, uh, piped into the water treatment system and water treatment uh, plants. And then it goes through a series of the cleaning process and disinfection process. Uh, after it's filtered, it, it goes through the disinfection. And after that is uh, it's been uh, disinfected, they will send them to the storage tanks. And from there, it's been distributed to the older residents. Public potable water supplies have uh, contaminated entire populations in Colorado, Milwaukee. The, the best thing you can do is make sure your water storage tanks and towers are clean. You wouldn't drink out of a dirty glass, so there's no reason to drink out of a dirty water storage tower. When I was handed the samples, uh, what I did was I mixed the samples up to try to get anything that's on the bottom of the sediment into the liquid. And then I took some of that liquid and added it to uh, nutrient media, chemicals that allow the bacteria to grow. All right, so uh, I took those samples and put them on an auger plate and then let them grow overnight at 30, 30 degrees Celsius. Once they had grown, uh, I was able to look at the actual colonies that were formed and look at the number of different types of colonies and the sizes of the colonies and the colors of the colonies. And based on the different numbers and sizes and colors, I was trying to get an estimate of the different number of bacteria that are in there. And what I saw was that in some of the samples, there was a large variety of bacteria that were present in these samples. And in other samples, uh, in one of the sediment samples, I didn't get anything. So they're not, they're not all contaminated. Most of the parasites and bacteria, they grow a lot better in a warmer temperature, especially with the water towers. They are uh, above the ground and exposed to the high temperature. The bacteria grows uh, a lot faster when the chlorine comes down, chlorine level goes down less than 0.5, it becomes uh, alarming. And then a lot of parasites in a higher temperature, they start hatching. And they assist hatch on the sediments of the water tanks. And then uh, it becomes a danger for the public. Yes, I think with warmer water, microbes are gonna grow faster and stronger. And then there's gonna be more of it in the sediment. Um, people are going to tend to use more water. There's more potential for that water, that sediment in tanks to get stirred up. Um, so yeah, I think climate change is going to make this problem worse. 